Thank you so much for joining us for this panel discussion. Uh, I am pleased to be joined by Jeff Ventrella, Peter Jones, and Cal Beisner, all of whom uh, gave excellent presentations. If you have not listened to their presentations in the Truth Exchange Symposium yet, I'd encourage you to go and find those videos on truthexchange.com or on YouTube at the Truth Exchange channel and listen to those presentations before you listen to this panel discussion because we will be referring back to their excellent, excellent presentations. And gentlemen, I was expressing to Dr. Jones uh, before we started this recording what a blessing it was to listen to him, and I would add this to the two of you, that as I listen to you talk about scripture, about our lives in this very real world uh, with a linear history um, and how we live as Christians, it causes me to love and admire the Lord in ways that I haven't before. And I, I want to thank you for that. I think that all of us as Christians can get so caught up, especially when we do cultural apologetics like we do here at Truth Exchange, we can get so caught up in looking at the problems that we face um, that we forget the peace and the comfort that we have when we rest our eyes on the Lord. And so thank you, each of you, for turning our eyes and our minds and our hearts back to the Lord today. Um, we did have several questions that came up from people who were in the audience um, as they listened to your lectures. And please feel free as I ask these, I'll be directing them at each of you, but to talk with each other too, um, because there was, there was such interesting overlap in the content of your presentations, even though you were dealing with very different issues. Um, the first question I had, Dr. Jones, is for you. As you went through the list, the, the list of 10 ways that the binary um, is true and superior, uh, we can only have certain truths uh, available to us when we have that binary view of the creator and the creation. I was reminded of a conversation that I had with a friend recently who said several different times that she thought that it was very important that education be taken back to a truly neutral and secular form of education. And I wanted to ask you if there really is truly secular, neutral education. That's an excellent question. And according to what the Apostle Paul says, there is no neutrality. There's either truth or falsehood. There's either worship of creation in one way or another, in a thousand different ways, actually, or this worship of the Creator. And probably sexual, sec, <laughs> sexual, sexual humanism is one of those ways of worshiping creation. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? How would secular humanism be creation worship? Well, if it's, well, it is that by denying that there is a God who is separate from us, who created us, who gave us the ability to argue in a secular way, even in a logical way. So inevitably, it will be a oneist system. So it seems then that anything that is true points to twoism or a creature-creator distinction. Anything true would, would point in that direction, would it not? Yes. <laughs> I'm working this out in my mind as I'm, I'm listening. Cal, did you have something to add to that? You know, the, the, <coughs> the Westminster Shorter Catechism defines God as uh, a spirit who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his wisdom, power, justice, holiness, goodness, and truth. That's a wonderful definition of God. But we don't always approach God only in terms of definition. There are also certain things that are implications of that definition. And though he was an awful, uh, unorthodox, uh, liberal theologian, I think Paul Tillich was right to say that whatever you considered to be your God would be your ultimate concern. 
And uh, for secular humanism, because there is nothing beyond matter and energy, matter and energy is the ultimate concern. And that means for secular humanism, that's God. You don't have the creator-creature distinction, so the universe itself becomes your God. And whether you consciously bow down and worship it, it still is your ultimate concern, which is part of why uh, so many environmentalists have a religious, almost uh, worshipful attitude toward the earth, uh, toward the, uh, the, the universe as a whole. And so if Tillich is right that whatever is your God is going to be shown to be that because it's your ultimate concern, then there is certainly no neutrality in a secularist sort of education because that's an education that says that the, 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 the matter and energy in motion, the universe, is all that is and is your ultimate concern. That brings to mind something you said in your talk, Jeff, um, and that was regarding how when we lack a morality that comes from the outside, we end up with tyranny. We end up with, um, I think you said that it was a search for power. Always there's a search for power if we're lacking in authority. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure, so um, I think C.S. Lewis, like he always does, gives us good pictures of things. And he said that a yardstick can't measure itself. It's obviously no standard. And so the point is that a standard to be viable must be outside the system in which it's applied. And so when we don't have that, if we just have our own selves, it becomes a jockeying job as to who gets to define and what the law is. There's no ability to critique. There's only a lust for power to who uh, is becomes predominant, who gets to win that sort of thing. It could be uh, the people. It could be the party. It could be even a constitution if there's nothing above it to inform it and to hold it. And so what happens is it leads to tyranny because you have all these competing factions going after each other, developing who's got the most power. The question then becomes who reigns it in, who corrects it, who can do that. And typically, people don't like power. Uh, an absolute power is uh, a problem, said Lord Acton. Uh, so I think that that's kind of where it goes. The example I gave in the presentation was alluding to the French Revolution, where everyone had their own reason, except they had to achieve that by killing the elites and those in power already. And then, of course, it became like the Ouroboros, the snake eating itself, uh, as Maximilien Robespierre found out, that he ends up, who used the guillotine, used, got it used on him. Because what happens is it leads to bloodshed, tyranny, and, and chaos, essentially, if there's no ex external order or reference. And then, of course, there has to be someone to quell that, that chaos, in the form of Napoleon Bonaparte, in the case of the French. And so I think that you'll see over and over again tyranny typically follows anarchy. I hear often expressed um, a fear of a Christian tyranny. So as we talk and as you talked about how we as Christians should legislate for the good, we should seek to follow what God has ordained as good and true in, in the ways that we structure society. I could hear in the back of my mind the concerns of people who say, well, even if you call it Christian, what if we end up under a system of sort, sort of like Sharia law? Uh, or you hear bandied about the idea of the tyranny of Christian nationalism that's coming. Um, what's the differentiating factor? How do we protect from that? I can understand and appreciate that. It's usually based upon a mischaracterization. I think the way to solve that is to understand that we're not simply saying formally that there is, uh, you could choose any religion and have that in ascendance. Rather, you have to look at what's the content substantively with respect to that. As it turns out, Christianity in the nature of the case is actually best fitted to God's created order and best fitted to the nature of the human person and to the human person's flourishing. Uh, all law draws lines. 
all law tells us what ought to be and what ought not to be. But the question is, which one conforms to reality? What we see historically is that those who consistently applied, and it's been misapplied, no question about that, but those who consistently applied the Christian worldview actually favored the raising of um, the dignity of women, the dignity of the other, the dignity of the individual. In fact, it was Christianity that actually created the notion of individual worth, dignity, and rights not associated with economics, not associated with sex, not associated with ethnicity or worship of the state and so on and so forth. So Christianity was tremendously liberating to the human person. So then the question becomes, is that systematized? Then what happens? Christianity stood against coercive conversions. Christianity stood against chattel slavery. Christianity stood against these things were actually enslaving and actually promoted a, a liberating sort of thing. So I, I guess I just finally leave that with a thought idea is that, and this is the Yale Divinity School person, Miroslav Volf, not really an Orthodox Christian, but a professing believer who says, that, look, it, what matters is, is what the religion actually does. If it believes in um, suppressing the infidel, killing the infidel, destroying monuments, destroying books, that's one thing, but if it means loving your neighbors, if it means protecting the oppressed, if it means on promoting liberty and, and outside of the state, that's something quite different. So we have to look at the content of the religion. And so religious liberty not only is for the individual conscience, but ultimately there have to be constraints on what is permitted in the name of religion. And coercion and suppression is not what the Christian worldview teaches it cre and what it does teach is that there's morality but that morality is structured in a way that is to promote human flourishing um. you had mentioned previously too I say yes please do um, all in favor of what Jeff is saying there's a text in first Timothy where Paul says in an odd way God is the savior of all men especially those who believe and uh, People have stroked, stroked their chins, wondering what that means. But I think if you understand that Savior means benefactor, God is the benefactor of all men as the creator, but especially of those who believe as the Savior, then we're blending together what I was saying and Jeff was saying too, that we have to know both God as creator and Savior, and knowing God as creator brings us ultimately to knowing him as Savior. So it's, y you cannot create a sort of a national cult like a church because we have to distinguish between God as creator and Savior, and the Savior is what makes us a church. So I think that that is a, a biblical way of keeping those two separate. And this ties in then to, I think, some of what you were talking about um, having to do with structural pluralism. Um, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. I think it's important to recognize that the notion of pluralism is a fairly recent convention. And, and I like to think of it in terms of ideological pluralism. The idea there is that, that the state basically controls anything goes and plays referee and says there's no differentiation between expressions within the public sphere, but the state is going to control that. That's kind of ideological pluralism, saying everything's equal and equatable, interchangeable. Um, but what I think is the better understanding is um, <coughs> structural pluralism. The idea there is that the structures of society provide equal opportunity to the participants in the society. And so the state in that case is not playing referee. In fact, the state plays less and less a role. And so it allows for opportunity or in the vernacular of jurisprudence, it protects negative rights. It prevents intrusion and allows more flourishing. And so whereas pluralism itself is a form of a political polytheism, actually, because it's saying that everything is its highest good, or as Cal was saying, its highest concern, quoting Tillich. 
Well, that can't be true. That's an incoherent position. Whereas structural pluralism says, no, there are norms and there are common goods, including freedom is a common good, and the state protects that in its structures to allow for those choices, morally accountable choices, but those choices to occur. As you talk about that structurally, and you've, re you've referenced a couple of times now that all of those structures must conform to created reality, the obvious place that that jumps out to me is there is a, a binary within humanity of male and female. And so when we try within medicine, when we try within sport, um, within uh, sex segregated spaces to say no, in fact, um, everyone's really the same and it has much more to do with how you identify in your mind. This does not conform to reality and it does damage. Um, so that, that's an obvious one to me, a place where I had not recognized it and I began to see it this morning. Cal was in your talk um, because you were referencing these hypotheses that scientists have put forth about global warming and the anticipated damages of global warming and legislation that is laid down to try to avoid those hypothetical damages, but because that doesn't seem to conform to reality, uh, created reality and the way the earth actually does operate, it seems that some of these actually do more damage than, than good. Do you see that in the studies that you do? Are some of these things that we're calling help to the climate actually doing damage because they're not based on reality? Absolutely. Um, and not only, by the way, to human well-being, to human prosperity, uh, we could look at how the demand that we substitute wind and solar, very diffuse, low density, uh, <coughs> excuse me, intermittent and therefore unreliable, therefore very expensive energy sources for hydrocarbon energy sources, coal, oil, and natural gas, we can see very clearly how that results in making less energy available for people to use and therefore less work gets done and therefore less food, clothing, shelter, communication, transportation, health care, everything else gets created. We can see all of that very clearly and easily. But what, <coughs> what is easily ignored is the problem that nature itself, <laughs> forget about human beings for a moment, terrible thing to do, uh, but nature itself suffers because of these things. So, for instance, I, I showed a slide where if you were to try to get all the electricity we now get uh, from, from fossil fuels, nuclear, hydro, and so on, from wind, uh, we would have to cover an area equivalent to two states of California with wind turbines. Yeah. That would be a terrible thing for nature. Similarly, if you cover a huge field with solar panels, all kinds of critters and plants that used to grow in that field can't grow in that field anymore because they're deprived of sunlight, they're, su they're subjected to the... the uh, uh, the, the runoff of, of toxic chemicals from the solar panels, all sorts of different things. But that doesn't even begin to, to touch the tip of the iceberg of this stuff. In order to generate the same number of gigawatts of electricity from wind or solar as from coal or natural gas, or in some places that use oil this way, uh, it's not as commonly used, but uh, places that do use it to, to generate electricity. In order to generate the same amount of electricity, you have to move scores and scores or hundreds and hundreds times more earth to mine the minerals necessary to make the wind turbines and the solar panels and the much greater amount of transmission wire and uh, transmission poles and so on necessary to get that energy to, to end users. And so you're mining much more and the toxic chemicals involved in the refining of those minerals are much worse than the toxic chemicals that 
come from refining coal, oil, and natural gas. So that's also a problem. Um, <laughs> frankly, well, uh, about a decade ago, I was starting a, uh, a journey from Phoenix to here in San Diego, where I spoke for Truth Exchange, and then all the way up the West Coast, speaking at various different places. Long before that, uh, two and a half decades before that, I had been a truck driver who often drove a route delivering stuff out into Palm Springs, Indio, Palm Desert from the warehouse in Garden Grove. And every day I would drive through the gap between Mount San Jacinto on my south and west and Mount San Gorgonio on my north and east. And it was a beautiful drive, a beautiful thing to do. And particularly coming back along, coming back late in the day along I-10, I would at one point top a rise and see that wonderful valley laid out in front of me with all its orange groves and, and grapefruit groves and everything else and the mountains on either side. And, and even in the summer, there was still snow on the tops of those two mountains. It was just beautiful. So I was eager for my wife to see this for the first time. We're driving along westbound on I-10. We top this rise. And I tell you that I simultaneously wept and cursed because that whole valley was covered with, you know it, wind turbines. And I thought, how can environmentalists think that this is friendly to the environment? This is, this is a total desecration of the environment. It's almost apocalyptic. I, Jeff? I want to circle back something Mary said in that, that warm-up to Cal's uh, response. You talked about using the law with respect to matters that obliterate the binary uh, between male and female. I want to show you what's going on there. If you abuse the human person, you will incorporate the power of the state to abuse its tools as well. Here's what I mean. Law is inherently an ethical operation. It draws lines. It tells us what we ought to do, what we ought not to do. That's what positive law does. Notice what's happening, though, in the bathrooms, the so-called gender ideology and everything else. It's now operating in the realm of metaphysics, not ethics. It was never designed to do that. And what could go wrong? Well, if I put you know, Diet Coke in my car, something's going to go wrong. Well, in the same way, if I use law in a metaphysical task or enterprise, it's not going to end well. And we need to call people out on that and say, this is not designed to do that. Jeff, that's excellent. And this is something that I learned from Peter, um, that we often seek to have the creative power of the word, right? So if I, if I say, I'm a man, or if I say trans men are men, I would like that to be reality, but because my language cannot change reality, then when I go uh, to try to enforce that reality, it becomes violence, it becomes destruction. So we give women who identify as men testosterone to give them the appearance of men, but it literally atrophies kills and causes the death of their very female bodies because our words do not have that metaphysical power to change reality. So um, I, I, that's excellent. That's an excellent example, I think, of the power of this cosmological um, tool that we have and have been using at Truth Exchange. We can see this in, in so many facets of culture and life. Um, but that leads me, I think, to a closing question for all of you. And this is one that I think a lot of generally evangelically trained men and women might ask in earnest, and that is that why do we care? If Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this world, that um, this world is going to be passing away, uh, why? Why should we care? Um, why should we be concerned with in engaging people about the truth 
engaging with people in politics, um, what's, what's the point? Well, Jesus also said that truth sets one free. So the propagation of the truth, or as John puts it, the light uh, dispels darkness. That's very important uh, that we can do that. Also, we need to understand that the ethics that we're called to do is not dependent upon, you know, whatever's inevitable or anything like that, that we have a moral obligation to advance a Christian ethic irrespective of where the chips are or what's on the table. And then I think that finally it's a matter of integrity. Uh, Christianity is a whole package. And so if we just pick and choose or, oh, I'm not going to do this, then we're actually depriving people of, get this, sanctification. We are sanctified by the word. Thy word is truth. And if we hinge it, cut off the nubs of it, suppress it, we are actually depriving people not only of redemption, but of sanctification following redemption. So there's three reasons I think we need to be concerned. I would just say that in affirming creation, what we can indeed affirm is that we're bringing good things to people. God is a good creator. He's the uh, savior of all men. He makes the rain to shine on the good and the bad. In other words, we live in a good creation made by a good creator. And I think that way of approaching the culture needs to be developed more and more as we try and think of the, the good implications, like he was saying about the beauty of that land that was destroyed. I think that makes a powerful point, and uh, we need to look at those kinds of things more and more. Pardon my hesitation here for a moment. Um, you know, I, th I think anybody who takes my kingdom is not of this world as somehow an excuse for uh, worldly or particularly political uh, inactivity for Christians misunderstands Jesus in some very important ways. Uh, he was not saying when he said, my kingdom is not of this world, that there were no implications of what he was saying for the you know, common everyday experiences of, of uh, human beings around him uh, or even for political structures. Uh, we ought to recognize that at, at the very least from the simple fact that the surest way for early Christians to become war martyrs was to refuse to say Caesar is Lord because for them, as Paul put it, for us there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. And that is why we will never call Caesar Lord. I'm sorry, I'm, I added that. Paul didn't write, uh, read, uh, write that last part. But we will never call Caesar Lord. Um, further, if we just look at uh, Jesus' own conduct, he was very politically active. And we don't tend to think of it that way because we don't think of Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes as political actors, we think of them as religious actors. But they were, in fact, the three chief political forces in Palestine at the time that Jesus lived there. And he attacked all three vehemently in quite a lot of different ways. I mean, at the very least, read Matthew 23. Uh, so Jesus was quite politically involved uh, in attacking the oppressors of his own society in that day. That means if, that if I am to follow Christ's example, I should be doing the same kind of thing. Um, additionally, we as Christians know that, that falsehood and and wrong and evil will never benefit our neighbors. But the two great commandments are to love God and to love neighbor. And 
Jesus illustrated the second one with the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we all think about how, of course, we're supposed to imitate the Samaritan there and to help the man who's been, <laughs> been accosted by thugs along the road. Similarly, Paul says in Galatians uh, 2.10 that when he visited the other apostles in Jerusalem, the one thing they asked him to do was to remember the poor. And he said, which is the very thing that I was already committed to doing anyway. And so if, <laughs> to me, it's, it's ironic that sometimes the calls for a politically unengaged Christian pietism in our day come from the Christian left, which has insisted on its own political engagement for decades. Um, no, it's, it is that we are all called as followers of Christ to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And that involves not just what we typically think of as religious exercise, but also political, cultural, social exercise, all wrapped together because all of it is a part of our, our service to God that should, be, sh should consume every aspect of our thought, every aspect of our words, and every aspect of our deeds. Gentlemen, I want to thank you, Dr. Jones, you in particular, because you're the one who gave me my job. I want to thank you for allowing me to sit up here and talk to you um, and to ask you about these things, to get to sit under your teaching. It's an absolute privilege. Um, I'm walking away with my heart and my mind filled. And uh, I want to encourage those of you who are watching online to visit truthexchange.com. Uh, Dr. Beisner, Dr. Jones, and Dr. Ventrella all have lectures from over the years that we have archived online. If you have questions, if you have issues that you think could use the application of oneism or twoism, of this hermeneutic, and you'd like to write to us, we will respond to you. So please do visit us, share this widely, and we pray that the Lord will bless you uh, with these messages and with this time together. Thank you so much.